Well, it's 8.02, and you know what that means. It is time for Family Medicine Grand Rounds. And this morning, it gives me incredible pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Joe Lorio, who serves as Director of the Addiction Medicine Fellowship at the Institute for Family Health. He's an Associate Professor of Family Medicine and Community Health at the Icon School of Medicine. He's got over 30 years of clinical experience as a family doc in underserved communities and sees patients at the Institute's Amsterdam Family Health Center. Um, as part of his family medicine practice, Dr. Lorio provides medication-assisted treatment for opioid dependence and other addiction services. His interest in addiction began while performing anthropology fieldwork in New York's Bowery as an undergraduate at Columbia. Later, during his tenure as a physician in the Indian Health Service, he broadened his experience treating alcohol, inhalant, and opioid use disorders. Back in New York, he published research in screening pregnant women for illicit substance use and participated in an early trial of primary care office-based methadone maintenance. Work on the Institute, worked at the Institute on developing a collaborative care model of mental health and primary care treatment in the early 2000s led to adoption of buprenorphine maintenance into his practice. He continues to champion integrating substance use identification and treatment into primary care. Dr. Lorio's research interests have been focused on addressing substance abuse in immigrant medicine, as well as a field of medical informatics, which deals with technical problems in maintaining and coordinating care. His early research has been cited in CDC protocols. Recently, his work in linking public health and primary care electronic health records has acted as a proving ground for protocols implemented by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene in their primary care health information project. And Dr. Lorio, not to be following anyone's mold, has a cast of 100 people that he's going to be joining him on Grand Rounds. And we really, really look forward to having you and um, hearing what you have to say. Take it away, Joe. Okay, thanks. Thank, thanks, so, thanks a lot. Okay, let me see if I can uh, share my screen here. Uh, all right. And okay, all right, hold on a second. That is wrong. Let's get back up to here. Let's try it again. There we go. Okay, so uh, can you see my screen there, Neil? Yes, looks good. Very good. Okay, great. All right, so uh, as Neil said, we've got a very distinguished panel to discuss the issue of alcohol use, use disorder. So I'm going to give an uh, sort of introduction discussing the state of the art of uh, uh, diagnosis and treatment of uh, AUD. And I'm going to talk very fast. I'm going to skip some slides uh, so that we can get to um, get to our distinguished panel. So I apologize if I'm talking fast and I'll be skipping. These slides should be shared to, for the general group and I'm going to be referring to that so that you can use them as references. So I'm not going to go into detail on all the slides. All right, so when we start, I want to say uh, no financial conflicts of interest. Um, uh, my salary um, comes 50% from patient care, 40% uh, from various grants, and 10% is coming from uh, Dr. Dr. Kalman. Thank you very much. Um, I am not going to be going over, uh, you know, cutting edge um, diagnosis and treatment of alcohol use disorder. And generally, I'm taking uh, consensus information, things that are standard of care. And I'm taking that from these different organizations that I'm putting up there, American Society of Addiction Medicine, the NIAAA, which is the research arm of NIH uh, addressing, uh, you know, alcohol uh, abuse and alcoholism. There's SAMHSA, which is the federal agency that is tasked towards uh, intervening in um, uh, substance, uh, substance abuse and uh, uh, addiction issues generally. Um, and also I'm looking at uh, you know, uh, evidence from uh, Cochrane Collaborative and also other meta-analysis. I'm very much biased, if there is a bias that I'm going to be talking about here, towards uh, meta-analysis and uh, organizations or groups that uh, look at groups of uh, research and all are able to rank them uh, as far as quality 
of the uh, of the research and looking for sources of bias. Um, and uh, we'll we'll get back to that. And of course, Co the Cochrane Collaborative is the uh, granddaddy of that whole that whole important scientific movement. Um, both of these uh, resources are ones which I've I've uh, borrowed uh, graphics and slides from. And once again, I'm looking at state of the art, uh, generally accepted care, not looking at too much cut, cutting edge stuff. All right, so. Let's looking at some epidemiology, all right? Mortality from uh, substance use. I mean, the, the, the number one uh, uh, preventable cause of uh, premature death in the United States and probably worldwide is nicotine. And we're all aware of that. This is uh, from the uh, landmark study that, that, that ranked these issues. And I do want to point out a couple of things. Alcohol is, this, is, 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 is behind um, uh, tobacco. Um, and where it is ranked here is it's interesting because all these other sources are causes of morbidity and mortality. Alcohol, they had here an area of benefit. And, uh, and this is, this is, this is from the analysis that was done in the uh, early 2000s. It was published in 2009. The idea that there's a cardiovascular uh, benefit from uh, from alcohol use, and so a prudent or low alcohol use uh, provides some benefit. There is a lot of debate now about the data that this is based on. They talk about the J curve, and that it is actually uh, not valid. Uh, and we can talk about that maybe offline if people want to discuss it. But but it would actually, if we take that away, that would bring the ranking up to. Uh, you know, maybe just after high blood pressure as a cause of, of, of premature death. And, uh, but you see, we, what we don't see on that particular list is, uh, is drug overdoses. And we know that we're in the midst of a uh, epidemic. And uh, I'm sure everybody is very uh, aware of this trend, you know, starting up a you know, gradual increase, thanks to our friends from Purdue Pharma and the Sackler family of promoting OxyContin. Uh, we started having more and more people uh, showing uh, dependency and addiction to opioids. And then with the advent of in the, um, the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, uh, things started increasing exponentially. They had sort of labeled up a little bit here, but increasing more to the point that in 2021, uh, definitely more than 100,000 Americans, 106, 107,000 Americans uh, died of, uh, of overdoses. So where, where does alcohol fit with this particular trend? Well, if we take a look at the data, uh, just pre-pandemic, this is, deaths from where alcohol was mentioned in the death certificate as one of the causes of death, all right? So that is either people dying of alcoholic cirrhosis or other alcohol complications or somebody uh, dying from a fall uh, where they were intoxicated that was mentioned on the death certificate. So we're coming over here to about... Uh, you know, uh, 90, 95,000 uh, up to 108,000 deaths per year in, uh, in, in 2021. You can see how with the pandemic, there was a stepwise increase. But we all know that besides individuals dying with alcohol as one of the primary causes, we have the other people in the car or that the, that the drunk driver, uh, you know, killed during the accident and various other uh, issues. So uh, if, you, if you put all that together, the CDC is saying that we've got about 140,000 Americans dying every year um, related to alcohol, alcohol-related deaths. But we're saying opioids now is at 100, 107,000, 140,000 dying from from alcohol all right and this slide is just going over some of those some of those reasons and of course alcohol is the predominant in, intoxicant in uh in north america and so 
uh, we're talking about um, 174 million people using alcohol as opposed to uh, 9 million uh, using uh, opioids um, in, a, in an annual basis. And, you know, looking at this, uh, the diagnosis of alcohol use disorder, uh, almost 30 million as opposed to 5.5 million uh, with opioid use disorder. Uh, and this follows as far as emergency department visits and and deaths, as we said. Here it says 80,000. That's wrong, obviously. It's it's 107 is the latest data, but even, even so. So just putting this all into perspective. All right. So when we're talking about alcohol use, what do we, what do we mean? What is this DSM criteria? And really, you want to think about the three C's, craving, loss of control, and consequences. All right. So craving, we're talking about physiologic dependence. You don't have the substance. Uh, you have an a, a desire, a physical desire for it. Tolerance is you need more and more of the substance to get the same effect. And then if you take away the substance, you have a withdrawal syndrome. When I was in medical school, I was taught that you had to have a withdrawal syndrome to be defined as an addiction, to be addicted to a substance. And I was taught in medical school back in the 70s that because of that, cocaine was not addicting. Well, we have obviously learned a lot since then, and it's clearly not true. But physiologic dependence is 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 an important criteria loss of volitional control all right and that means unsuccessful attempts to cut back someone doesn't want to use someone wants to control it they can't help themselves increasing amounts of time being sent and then consequences is failure to fulfill major role obligations um continuing to use in the face of adverse consequences all right. That also is looking at loss of volitional control. What is very interesting about this is that when you look at the DSM-5 criteria for opioid use disorder or for stimulant use disorder or gaming disorder, it is identical. All right. So it's very interesting that this syndrome of substance use disorders seems to be almost identical across different substances. And it doesn't matter whether they're primarily causing a release of dopamine, they're affecting the GABA system like uh, alcohol does. Um, it all seems to follow the same pattern. And I'm gonna to return to this in a minute, all right? So moving on to actual patient care, screening for alcohol use disorder. So traditionally what we've done is that we have Ask patients, how much do they drink? Do they drink? And if they do, how much? For people who are assigned female at birth, the number of drinks traditionally should be no more than three, no more than seven a week. For assigned male at birth, it's four at any one sitting and uh, 14 per week. Now, the saying assigned female at birth, if somebody is trans and they're taking hormones um, and it's changing the uh, the amount of uh, the lean body mass um, uh, because the reason why uh, women um, are, are get intoxicated with alcohol at a lot with 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 fewer drinks is because alcohol is water soluble and women have a higher percentage of their of their total body is fat which is the alcohol so uh, one one drink will will give a higher um, blood alcohol level than it is for somebody um, who's male. You're receiving hormones that changes it. So I'm not sure that I would I would agree with the assigned female or assigned male at birth, um, but that's up for debate. But recently, um, there has been a recommendation that acceptable amount of alcohol um, is actually less than that. Uh, you know, for women, no more than one drink in a single day, and for men, no more than two. Uh, for adults over age 65, no more than one drink a day. I can certainly say, uh, as someone who's about to turn 70, that um, I can't hold my uh, my liquor. I can, I, one half glass of wine is uh, uh, more than plenty for me now. 
Uh, and of course, obviously, if you, if a person is pregnant, they should uh, abstain entirely. Uh, and 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 we we that's not news. So this is this is uh, these recommendations are coming from the National Center of Health Promotion and Disease Prevention. You know, and I think there's a there's more and more consensus that this is actually appropriate, especially given the fact that that there is more uh, questioning of uh, of the cardiovascular benefits of uh, of, of low alcohol use. All right. So once you have somebody and you expect they have a drinking problem, then then where do you go from there? Well, uh, the the best, in my opinion, way to do it is to is is to do the alcohol use disorders identification test. Uh, for those of us who are using Epic, it's in the um, screening section of our electronic health record, readily available. Uh, actually, people are led to it. Um, with the with 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 the screening that's done by our medical assistants, but but for those um, who are listening or or watching this um, presentation, I'm sure uh, you can get it through your electronic health record. But even better, uh, in a lot of ways, is you can just Google it. All right, because if you're able to do that, then you're able to get a um, a version of the audit test, which is which is really designed for the patients to self-administer. And a lot of times what I'll do if I suspect that someone has got an alcohol use problem is I'll pull this up and I'll say, here, why don't you go through this and I'm gonna go see another patient and then I'll come back here and we'll go through the results and we'll talk a little bit more. Uh, it's also very helpful that people um, uh, are able to maybe be a little bit more honest if they're uh, doing this uh, assessment uh, uh, in 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 privacy without the uh, without the doctor or nurse uh, looking over their shoulder. All right, and so uh, moving quickly and getting back to the idea of dependence. I mean, as clinicians, uh, I think most of our experience is in dealing with and managing alcohol withdrawal. Someone will come into the hospital, they have broken their leg or they've got uh, need uh, their appendix out, and then they go into alcohol withdrawal once they're uh, hospitalized and can no longer get their alcohol. Um, or somebody is admitted for alcohol withdrawal. And we've gotten pretty good at managing that. And uh, so I don't want to go into this in too much detail, but I think this is a good graphic. We're looking at when somebody has an alcohol dependency, then uh, to maintain equilibrium, their central nervous system has reduced the sensitivity of their GABA receptors. Alcohol uh, works by uh, stimulating uh, the GABA system. And uh, so the receptors are downregulated and there's an upregulation in receptor numbers. And then if you take away the alcohol suddenly, uh, which would be in this particular graphic, the, uh, the gentleman with the red hair uh, takes his hand off the teeter-totter and then uh, this uh, this cute little boy will uh, wind up coming coming down to a uh, you know a somewhat violent landing, and the, uh, the the monkey goes goes flying in the air. So that's something we want to avoid. You want to uh, you you want to allow this uh, adaptive uh, equilibrium to readapt to uh, not having this uh, this the the alcohol. And so, you know, how do we, uh, you know, how do we do that? So um, I have a slide here. I'm not going to go into it going into the whole pattern of uh, alcohol withdrawal, but usually uh, mild withdrawal can last three days where you can have a severe withdrawal and delirium tremens that can go on for two weeks, but there's the general, and I'm sure a lot of us uh, know this information. Uh, certainly anybody who has, you know, done a uh, medical internship in the hospital has managed plenty of patients with alcohol withdrawal. So I'm not going to go into any of that. But that being said, it's important to look at complicated versus uncomplicated withdrawal from alcohol. Uncomplicated withdrawal, early symptoms, uh, anxiety, diaphoresis, nausea, vomiting, definitely a tremor. And that's from lack of GABA. Complicated withdrawal is when you have uh, a profound excess of glutamate. And those are the people who can go on to delirium tremens. And delirium tremens actually will have a significant mortality uh, even nowadays with our ability to manage people in the ICU, but these people wind up in the ICU. 
All right. Now that's only about 5% of withdrawal. So that means that 95% or 19 out of 20 people going into alcohol withdrawal can actually be managed in an outpatient setting. They don't have to be admitted. All right. If you're going to be doing that, if you're going to be managing somebody in an outpatient situation, you need to be able to do it right. And that means you need a support system. You're not going to send somebody to to deal with an ambulatory detox if they are uh, unhoused. They need to have a support system. Uh, hopefully, you need to have somebody at home with them who can who can help and support them. Um, we have to be able to check in. So we don't say, I'm going to give you uh, uh, this detox protocol and I'll see you in two weeks. No, we really have to check in on a daily basis. And um, obviously, no significant comorbid no comorbidities, nobody who's pregnant, uh, nobody who's had severe withdrawal. Clearly, if someone has gone through DTs in the past, has been in the ICU, has had seizures, well, that's kind of there. That's 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 a predictor that that's going to happen again. And so uh, that's not somebody who is really qualified for uh, for an outpatient detox. But if we're going to be doing an outpatient detox, the generally the standards of care are, are benzos or gabapentin. Now it's interesting that we've all who've worked in in the hospital are very familiar with the Librium taper, uh, and uh, that's sort of this there's the general standard. Though sometimes people use uh, you know barbitol or uh, you know other other medications. Turns out gabapentin is generally safer. There's less sedation, so that's better for an ambulatory detox. There's less kindling. There means uh, people are less likely to develop a seizure disorder as part of their uh, their alcohol withdrawal syndrome. And uh, so actually, that should be the the go to for an ambulatory uh, detox. Now we've had good success about. Uh, using a protocol that's been developed by our friends up at Rochester, University of Rochester, which is based on um, valproic acid, Depakote, and using uh, gabapentin with that and some other medications. But um, the, the standard that's generally published and accepted by the professional societies is using either benzos or, or gabapentin. Um, and here's the protocol. You guys can uh, look at this when you look at the slides. Um, I'm not going to go into that too, too much, but usually you can go through, uh, you know, four to five days and you've gotten through your mild withdrawal. All right. I have a slide here on inpatient detox with more detail. I'm not going to go through this. All right. I'm sure a lot of people already know that. So after you've detoxed your patient to see what scale is normal, the patient is cured, right? Well, obviously that's a straw a man that I'm going to knock over. That's clearly not true. But that being said, that's how we generally treat patients. We detox them. They're no longer tremulous. We say, great, uh, here's a list of different alcohol programs you can go to if you so choose. Good luck, buddy, and hit the street. All right. And that is not appropriate. Because we understand the biochemistry of alcohol withdrawal, we sort of thought we understood alcoholism, all right? And if we detox someone, then they are cured. But that's not true. Now, I want to bring up a landmark study that was just published back, back in September. Now, like I said, I promised I wasn't going to be doing cutting edge, but this is very important information. These people took Imaging study, neuroimaging studies have been published for multiple substance use disorders. That's not just alcohol use. That's opioid use disorder. That's stimulant use disorder. That is, you know, uh, nicotine addiction. Uh, that's also gaming use disorder, gaming disorder. And looking at these functional MRIs, and they found patterns of attenuation in the prefrontal cortex, increased um you know, linkages between the hippocampus and the limbic, limbic system. And they were very characteristic and they matched each other across these different substance use disorders. And very significantly different than comparisons to people who had traumatic brain injury or people who had suffered strokes or people who are quote unquote normal controls. 
right? So this is very, very interesting because looking at this is understanding that somebody with alcohol use disorder and other addictions have a brain pattern, all right, that, that, is, that is more than just a chemical imbalance, that there have been changes in neural pathways and atrophy and increase in activity in certain parts of the brain, which while the brain is plastic, take years to resolve. So one way to look at this is like someone who's had a stroke. Acutely, someone comes in, you give them clot blessing drugs, or you go in with the neurosurgeons and you remove the embolus that's in the you know mineral cerebral artery and uh, you get their blood pressure under control, but then they're being discharged through rehab. It's going to take years before people are able to start walking and talking and functioning uh, at a reasonable uh, reasonable rate. And they're never going to be the same again after you have someone had a stroke. All right. And I think we need to think about people who've got alcohol use disorder in a similar way. So we know how to do rehab for stroke. So what's what's the treatment for alcohol use? And what's the best evidence? All right. And so that's what I'm going to go through now. All right. So we're medical doctors and providers this in family medicine. So we'll let's talk about medicine. There are three medications which have been approved by the FDA as safe and effective for alcohol use disorder. There's now Trexone, which is the drug of choice. It's cheap. It's safe. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's effective. The number needed to uh, treat to reduce uh, alcohol intake by about 50% is 12 uh, for those who are not completely comfortable with this particular value, number needed to treat, uh, the number needed to treat to prevent a stroke or a hypertension is about 30, all right? Um, goal of abstinence, number needed to treat is 20. Now, this is very effective. It's not as good as methadone or, or suboxone for opioid use disorder where the number needed to treat is two, but definitely effective. A campersate, a little bit more expensive. It's a TID drug, harder to take. But goal of abstinence, 12. That's 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 pretty good. Disulfiram, which is the first drug that was approved by the FDA, a little bit more problematic, but there's definitely a place for it. All right. Um, I've got this slide here. I'm not going to go through it, but there's more details about uh, the uh, contraindications and other issues about prescribing. I uh, strongly encourage you to take a look at that slide when you when when you review it later. All right. There are two non FDA approved meds with very strong evidence for efficacy for treatment for alcohol use disorder. Gabapentin, not just for alcohol withdrawal, can be very helpful, especially as a sleeping pill for people who um, have become sober, but sleep disturbance is a terrible problem with people, especially for the first year after they have stopped using alcohol. Um, and it can be helpful on a uh, TID basis. Uh, it's cheap um, and it can be also helpful for who you will have alcoholic neuropathy. So that's a good thing to know. Topiramate um, is also helpful. That's BID. So that's a little bit easier to take. Uh, all these, both these drugs are sedating, but that can be helpful. And if people have had alcohol withdrawal seizures, that can sometimes be a go-to medicine because that can help depress seizures. And it's also a generic and nice and cheap. All right. So how about AA? Well, there was a very, very good Cochrane uh, meta-analysis looking at multiple studies. Um, there is um, uh, a... Uh, um, sort of a, a myth that goes or that's going around that that there is no evidence of efficacy for Alcoholics Anonymous. That is not true. All right, uh, there's very high quality evidence that manualized uh, Alcoholics Anonymous or twelve step facilitated program interventions are effective, and not only that, they are more effective than this other than any other studied established treatments. All right. Now, this graphic here is just one of multiple outcomes that are reviewed in this particular study. So this is very important information. Um, it used to be that there was no good data because uh, the anonymous part of AA uh, made people very uh, reluctant 
to participate in um, in research studies. Um, that is no longer the case, and there is there is good high quality evidence. This is really um, the best intervention we have uh, as far as uh, you know managing uh, you know alcoholism in the in the long term. Other therapies that have been shown to be helpful, motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, those uh, definitely are effective. Uh, community reinforcement, 12-step uh, facilitation is another uh, psychotherapy which has been uh, proven to be effective. And uh, community reinforcement uh, and family training, bringing family in. I mean, we're a family medicine uh department and it's very important to involve family members and uh and th these are formal ways of doing it it's also important because a lot of times remember one of the key parts of alcohol use disorder is loss of volitional control and a lot of the people need to be in a supervised environment they need to be in a 30 90 day uh, program where they're supervised and they're getting therapy and then people being able to move on to long-term Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, as they move through sobriety and recovery. Um, but definitely there is not only a place uh, for, uh, for psychotherapies, uh, but if they, they, they really can be looked at as essential. And I'm not trying to rank all of these therapies in a way saying that one is better than the other because really we need a multi-pronged approach. Medication, uh, mutual assistance, psychotherapy, there are, that really needs to be part of a you know family-based therapy, all needs to be part of uh, recovery. So in summary, um, alcohol use disorder is a treatable chronic relapsing disease, all right? Not curable, but treatable, just like hypertension or diabetes. Uh, second only to nicotine as a substance use cause of mortality in the United States. Treatment of alcohol withdrawal is obviously necessary, but it is not sufficient. All right. People are not cured by a detox. AA and manualized 12-step programs are the most effective means to address loss of volitional control. That is a key characteristic of substance use disorders. Professionally led psychotherapies can be effective, especially when a patient is not willing or able to engage in AAA. All right. And medication has been proven to increase sobriety and decrease total alcohol intake. So, I had promised I would do this in 30 minutes and 35. So let's get to our panel. So uh, we're lucky to have Dr. Timothy Brennan, who is the program director of the Addiction Medicine Fellowship at our uh, sister program at Mount Sinai West and uh, Mount Sinai Morningside, uh, the Addiction Institute. Uh, Abigail Heron. Uh, a Vice President, Behavioral Health Director of Psychiatry and Addiction Medicine at the Institute for Family Health, my boss. Goldie Alfasi, the Senior Behavioral Scientist at uh, the Mount Sinai Beth Israel Residency. Uh, Jay Pierce, uh, who is the Psychosocial Director at our Harlem Family Medicine Residency and who uh, teaches our addiction fellows in motivational interviewing. Joel Panthapatu, or Dr. P, who's the lead addiction medicine, uh, lead, lead, leads our addiction medicine specialty track at our Mid-Hudson Family Medicine Residency. And Dr. Timothy Reed, internist and chair of the Caduceus Group, which is AA for healthcare providers, and also on the planning board of international providers and Alcoholics Anonymous. So welcome, everybody. If we can have people... Um, uh, be uh, um, uh, so you can uh, turn on your cameras, and uh, I'd like to sort of start by presenting a uh, a case, and then uh, open it up for the uh, for the group to discuss. All right, so 
This is a patient that I actually just saw a couple of weeks ago when I was precepting at our Harlem program. One of our uh, residents was running behind and the nurse came to me and said, can you just quickly see this patient? He's a diabetic. He's well controlled. He just needs his meds refilled. Can you just sort of get him in and out? So uh, RJ, 67-year-old, type 2 diabetic, hypertensive, hyperlipidemia, sort of one of our standard bread and butter family practice patients who just came for to get his medications refilled. When I looked at his problem list, I could see he had a history of DKA, which is interesting for a type two diabetic. Uh, also drug abuse in remission and at risk alcohol consumption. He had five emergency room visits in the past four years for various reasons, none were for intoxication. And his meds were uh, baby aspirin, metformin, Lozartan, nifedipine, atorvastatin, pretty standard for our uh, our, our type 2 diabetics. But because I saw at-risk alcohol consumption and sort of piqued my interest, I said, I asked him a little bit more. And he says, well, I, I don't, he only drinks beer. And I said, well, you know, what kind? And it was malt liquor. And I said, it's just a six-pack. I said, you know, if those are the little cans or the big cans? He said, oh, no, the tall ones. And, you know, 18-ounce malt liquor. And he said that uh, actually his first drink of the day is uh, in the morning. And often uh, he has a beer for breakfast. And actually, that's usually what his breakfast is. Um, but he didn't have breakfast today because he was fasting in case uh, I needed to draw some bloods for before we refilled his diabetes medicine. His vitals showed he was mildly hypertensive, 146 over 77. Pulse was a little fast at 97, a febrile, cheerful, alert, cooperative delightful, engaging person. His lab showed an A1C of 6.1, very well controlled. His uh, liver functions were normal. So here's this guy. Um, so I'd like to leave this for the, for the group. And um, if we could uh, take a look at um, uh, the... Uh, the group of anybody uh, anybody wants to, to to chime in here and tell me what tell me what they think. Um, let's see if I could see anyone want to raise anyone want to start in this group. Uh, how about doc, Dr. Brennan? What do you, what do you think about this case? Well, thanks, uh, Dr. Lorio. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. You know, I think. This is a classic scenario for me of somebody who just looking at his labs and his cheerful demeanor, there doesn't seem to be any obvious leverage point necessarily for us to talk to him about the negative consequences of alcohol. But no matter if there were, I usually like to ask people like, you know, what are the good things they get out of drinking, right? Because I, for me, starting off from a adversarial perspective, um, is oftentimes not effective. So I'd probably do a bit of a, you know, more thorough alcohol history, maybe an audit, something like that to get a bit of more of a sense of the way alcohol is serving or not serving him. Um, and recognize, especially in primary care, that this might not be the moment that he's ready for a script for naltrexone, but it might well be the time that he's ready for a longer uh, conversation and if we see them longitudinally, there's opportunities going forward. So I'd probably delve a bit more into the history uh, and be very respectful of uh, of his autonomy in that process. Thank you, Doctor Doctor P. Yeah, unmute yourself. Yeah, I think one thing that I would right off the bat acknowledge is actually his presence in the room just because his willingness to at least answer the question, because even though he probably feels as though it's a routine visit, I'm just here for my medication refills, he actually answered the questions that were that were being presented. He could have easily just dismissed them and stated that it wasn't really a big deal. And I think the willingness to acknowledge it, I think is sometimes that wedge where you can create that impact in, in the patient. So I think that's certainly one thing right off the bat that I would acknowledge with this patient. Mm. Mm. Any other, any other thoughts? Any other thoughts? I mean, I can, I can tell you what, what, what happened. I mean, first of all, my impression is 
by the by the way, I mean the fact that his blood pressure was up and his pulse was a little high was showing that he was showing a, some signs of 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 withdrawal. Um, we may actually have been over medicating him for his blood pressure because he always shows up sober. sober. Um, and so sometimes people uh, will start getting dizziness or uh, other other symptoms because once they're back at their at their baseline alcohol intake, um, they're being over medicated. So that's that's one 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 thought and and to consider. But the other other thing is, oh yeah, uh, Dr. Heron. Thanks, Joe. I wanted to add in, um, you know, I really appreciate the frame of taking a motivational approach. Um, you know, as when I'm working in my capacity as an addiction psychiatrist, like explicitly, a lot of the hard work has been done. Um, and the same thing for, you know, Dr. Brennan, when someone presents seeking treatment at the Addiction Institute, right? <laughs> coming into detox, coming into inpatient rehab, there's a level of acceptance already. You know, there's still a long road to go, but there's a level of acceptance that there's a problem with substances going on. And often I think for our primary care colleagues um, or for people who are working in, in general practices, that's a lot of the work is that rapport building and the trust and developing that time for people to start to have that. Um, and for, you know, many of us here who spend um, a lot of our time kind of on the behavioral health side and thinking about a motivational approach, you know, that's really the key. Medications are, are helpful for alcohol. They are not the slam dunk that they are for opioids. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, really so much of the behavioral and the motivational part is so central to our work. And so many of our patients with alcohol use disorder also are able, and I'd be interested to hear Dr. Reed, who has a strong 12-step um, connection, you know, to talk about um, how with alcohol in particular, a lot of this is not going to be pharmacologic. And so, really looking at that motivation, giving people the chance to start thinking, well, what do I like and what do I dislike about alcohol and developing that discrepancy, that's really the way that change happens, right? People only change if there's some sort of discrepancy between their goals and their current behavior. Otherwise you say, I'm doing great. I'm gonna keep doing exactly what I've been doing. Um, and so you know, I think looking for those entry points are really key because a lot of what people see here um, at the Institute is just more of that kind of suspicion of like, we think maybe something is wrong, but it's not so explicit uh, on the part of the patient. Yeah. Dr. Reed, did you have more you wanted to say about that since I had mentioned sort of the other, the non-pharmacologic approaches too? Yeah, first I wanted to say uh, thank you for acknowledging the, the role of AA in uh, addressing uh, substance use disorders. You know, in my own experience and, uh, you know, experiencing the uh, community of healthcare providers in AA and NA in New York City uh, that I'm very familiar with, it's been of tremendous, tremendous value I, in uh, helping uh, us providers. Uh, you know, I know for this patient in particular, he's probably not going to be receptive to, you know, the, the idea of going to AA meetings, though uh, he may very well down the road. Usually it takes a more you know, acute presentation or greater consequences uh, than it seems that he's experienced yet. But, um, you know, the fact that he has an eye opener, you know, in the morning, that's of, uh, you know, that that's a, a, a warning sign right there. Uh, but yeah, it's, I, I can't over uh, state the, the value of 12 step uh, programs, right, for people with alcohol and other uh, substance use uh, disorders. Uh, you know, again, both from a, a, per, a personal and a, a professional perspective. Like right now, we have five uh, 12 step meetings a week just for healthcare professionals in New York, and they're, they're very well attended. And uh, most of us have uh, uh, sustained recovery for, you know, years, if not decades. Dr. Alfasa, you had your hand up before? Yes. Yeah. Um, you, yeah. It, was, it, was a, it was a previous point, but I, I kind of want to go back to it, which is the assessment of motivation for someone who comes into primary care. Because as other people pointed out, they're not coming in complaining 
of their substance use disorder. They're coming in usually complaining about something else. Um, so in assessing the motivation, what we tend to look for in primary care is some medical uh, impact of the substance use disorder, and that can work. But in fact, what we need to look for as well is what is the hook for this particular patient? And it might be a, a medical consequence or it might be something else. So um, I think it was mentioned before that we start with where, uh, where the patient is at. First of all, I think getting the patient's permission to have this discussion, I think is important in getting buy-in. Um, and then what, what does the substance use do for them? And then finally, a little bit about what kind of consequences are they experiencing? And are these consequences that actually matter for them as a way of really looking for and listening for some something that will enhance their motivation for change. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that that's very important. Uh, and and the other thing to mention is that you know we are under a tremendous amount of time pressure in primary care. I mean, remember that that I was asked to see this patient because the resident who was running behind, and uh, and I had to continue you know precepting the the resident clinic. And so I was feeling a lot of time pressure. And to open up this kind of can of worms is an issue. One of the benefits we have in primary care is in, is in continuity, is that we can be seeing people over time in multiple visits. Uh, but that time pressure is, is, is still very, very good, uh, very much there. Um, so let me just let me just sort of tell tell you what what happened with with this person and then there's a comment in the uh, in in the chat which I'd like to address. So uh, when I saw this person I said to him I said well you know um uh what do you think if uh if I was able to give you a medicine that could um make that six pack of malt liquor last uh, two days instead of one day would you be interested in taking it? And he opened up his wide eyes and smiled and say, yeah, I really like that. And I said, well, there's this pill called naltrexone, and I think it might really make the, uh, the six pack last longer for you. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then when you come back, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see how that went. And he took that prescription very readily. He was along with his refills of his metformin and, and nifedipine. And uh, so we'll see, we'll see what happens. And that was a pretty, uh, you know, quick uh, response and, it, and it, it addressed it as a, uh, uh, as an issue. So I just want to read the comment um, uh, uh, from Jinsi Therian. Uh, Patients have expressed 12-step AA programs um, have been known to preach complete abstinence. Use of medication for cravings is shamed and almost seen as a failure because now they are dependent on another substance. How do we bridge that discrepancy for patients? So I'm going to uh, direct that at Dr. Reed since he's our, uh, you know, expert on on AA, and then then uh, be curious to see what other people on the panel have to say about that comment because that's that's a very a uh, very very frequent uh you know comment and issue that that comes up yeah that that's an excellent uh sticking point uh for better or worse uh you know aa na does preach uh abstinence and they you know it can come across as uh preachy um uh, you know i know in my own personal experience in groups of you know, somebody is on uh, medication, you know, uh, like a, a benzo for anxiety and just can't seem to get off it. You know, they're not stigmatized for, you know, taking the drug. Um, what absolutely would be frowned upon is, you know, somebody having, you know, cutting down from 10 drinks a day to one drink a day and still, uh, you know, still drinking, you know, with perhaps no plan for uh, stopping drinking altogether. Um, so, it, you know, it definitely, the, the abstinence-based approach definitely, uh, uh, it, it 
uh, it makes the umbrella smaller, you know, that we, you know, try to hold over, you know, our fellow, you know, travelers through recovery. And, you know, I, I know there's other programs out there like Dharma Recovery, Smart Recovery. I really don't know too much about them. I, I imagine they're less, uh, you know, dogmatic about uh, complete and total abstinence. Uh, but I, I can't really uh, speak to that. But, you know, absolutely, uh, you know, abstinence-based programs like AA and NA, you know, they they can come uh, across as, you know, Bible thumping, you know, maybe a little extreme to some that are, you know, entering this this world of recovery. And it might seem a little extremist. But, you know, in my experience, for a lot of people that really have the disorder, you know, any use is too much use. And, you know, one drink a day leaves that door open to, you know, going back to where they were before. And, uh, you know, it, it's, but, you know, there's, you know, more than one way to skin a cat, uh, certainly. And I'd hate to, you know, a, uh, you know, uh, insist on a one size fits all uh, program. Yeah, I just want to point out, you know, to the general community here, Dr. Reed was 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 very much involved in uh, initiating and working with the uh, health and hospitals uh, program to provide um, telehealth uh, buprenorphine for opiate use disorder, and um, there is some, uh, I think, issues with. Um, AA and NA, where a lot of people will say is if somebody who's taking buprenorphine, suboxone, or other medications, uh, antidepressants, uh, that they need to be quote unquote drug free. And if you actually look at the big book, uh, it does say that patients are expected to take the medicines that were prescribed by their healthcare professional. So there is like an ethos that may be floating around. Uh, and NA and AA about no medication at all. And I think that's not really valid. I mean, I don't know if you want to talk to that at all, Tim. Uh, you know, there's an ethos of no psychoactive uh, medications. Um, so, you know, naltrexone, you know, antidepressants. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I know in some really hardcore, you know, conservative uh, recovery circles, right? Even antidepressants are uh, frowned upon, but, um, you know, no, prescribed medications, you know, by a knowledgeable uh, doctor, you know, certainly are, uh, are okay. You know, when you start getting into the, the psychoactives, you know, that's where it gets a little stickier, but, uh, In our group, you know, he takes uh, benzos, you know, he has for for years. Uh, he's very open about it. Um, you know, nobody considers him not uh, to be sober, you know, not to be working a good program. He's very highly functional. Um, you know, it, it's kind of I think we have to be more open minded, you know, about uh, individual cases and, you know, the reasons for, for taking these meds, you know, uh, low dose opioids, you know, buprenorphine, you know, my, my own, uh, uh, impression is that it's, it's fantastic. You know, some people just have a lot of trouble going to total abstinence, right. But, you know, some buprenorphine, um, you know, like we found in the, virtual buprenorphine clinic at uh, Bellevue, you know, during the pandemic, uh, kept them out of the ER, you know, kept them off the streets. It was uh, a kept very- them, Kept them alive. Robot. Kept them alive. Absolutely. Yeah. Dr. Alfasi. Yeah. Dr. Alfasi, you have your hand yes. up. Um, just wanted to add a little bit to that. And that is that one of the difficulties that's kind of related to this difficulty um, was that uh, is that there's a reliance in AA on the higher power. And 
For some people, um, as opposed to, for instance, reliance on medication, that's sometimes put in contrast. Um, and for some people, in addition to the issue around medication, there's the issue of the spirituality of AA. And um, some people get really turned off by that. For, for many, of course, it's vital. But for others, they get turned off. And there are other 12-step options outside of AA that uh, are a, a little bit more liberal about medication issues and also don't really focus on the spiritual aspects of it, like smart recovery. And in addition, have uh, some more um, kind of skills-based uh, training as part of the as part of the twelve step process. So just just for people to know that there are options for people who are having trouble with AA. Although I do think that the best evidence is for AA, and if someone uh, can use AA, that would be my go to place. Dr. Herring, you had had your hand up before. I was going to echo a lot of what um, what Goldie said, and also just an add a reminder that you know function and and um, Dr. Reed touch on this, but function is what we care about. So there are lots of patients who 12 step doesn't resonate for them. Um, you know, they don't necessarily like groups. If they're doing well, that's fine. Um, you know, there are other people who do it that way. There are people who do it in, in patient rehab and there's no one path. And I think, um, you know, I believe very much in 12 step is being helpful. It's also available. It's free. Um, you can get it on the internet, especially with COVID. It's become very easy to access. And I, I will remind people, if you've been to 1A meeting, you've been to 1AA meeting, there are incredibly different ones. I mean, in New York City, there are ones for people that like Stephen King books. And there are ones for people that want to be able to drink a certain type of coffee while they're having their meeting. And like, you can find your people as part of a, um, a social and sober network. But all of these are valid paths to recovery and there's no one best way for everyone. And if you can achieve a, a, a better functional status with less use of alcohol without 12 step, that's also great. Um, and I, I think that that's what you're hearing from all of us is that, you know, these, these are all kind of um, open and available paths to just keep in mind. I see Jay. Jay, Jay. yeah. Uh, I would say that if you're in a conversation with somebody about their preferences on AA, you're you're already way ahead of the game because that means you're actually uh, debating what is going on. And I think, you know, just to, to plug AA a little bit, it, it's not just woo-woo. You are trying to shift someone from having a local sense of what matters to a global sense of what matters. And AA provides this group that you are suddenly responsible to. You don't want to look bad to them. And it helps your whole uh, challenge of saliency that Dr. Lorio mentioned with the change in brain structure. And it helps you really rebalance what might be important to you to call your sponsor that suddenly uh, something matters a bit more than just reaching for a drink so I, I really want to support that but mostly if you are in that kind of conversation with somebody that's great because it's now well if that's not working for you what else can we try and you're really able to hook on with them as as uh, dr heron said as to what matter or, or dr alfasi about their health or whatever so thank you <laughs> yeah it's um i you can't always get somebody to uh, accept the best treatment, and uh, any treatment you can you can do uh, is a benefit and gets the patient a little bit farther towards um, you know being optimally uh, optimally managed. You know, and clearly, uh, if the best you can do is have somebody taking now Trexone and uh, they're going through. Uh, three cans of malt liquor a day instead of six, uh, that has a real health benefit. Uh, it ain't abstinence, but uh, it's going to definitely have a, uh, uh, you know, have an impact. So we're after nine o'clock. Um, I, I have a bunch of other cases to discuss, but I think uh, the, the people at, at Rounds have actually got to start seeing patients. So uh, I really want to thank everybody for uh, for being here. This is a, a, a really, really great discussion. Uh, uh, just the start of it, too. Um, 
thank you, Joe, for putting this together. Obviously, it's a it's a subject that needs a lot a lot more time and attention. But I, I think as an overview um, has been fantastic, and really appreciate the participation of uh, of everybody here. So uh, well done, well done. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Have a great holiday. Um, can't believe that we're gonna see you in a new year again. Um, but uh, hope everybody has a safe and and healthy and um, alcohol free holiday. No, <laughs> speak to you later. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dr. Lorio. All right.